Hey troops, welcome to the channel Gen Dick Commando. My name is Ryan and I'm a former Royal Marine from the United Kingdom. And today we're reacting to part two of the Jeffrey Dahmer original Stone Phillips interview. We're just getting into the nitty gritty bits now, guys. So like, share and subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already. And I'll see you in the comments. So much in a chimes as it was wanting to withdraw from tension and arguments and problems in the house. That's how I saw it, yeah. Just, uh, uh, I, I uh, sort of uh, lived in my own little fantasy world when things got too heated in the household. It was just, uh, just my own little world where I had control. That fantasy world may have been Jeffrey's retreat from violence as a boy, but as he grew up, it would become a world filled with violence. Maybe I felt, uh, I had no control as a, as a child or young adult, and uh, that got mixed in with my sexuality, and I ended up doing what I did was my way of, of feeling in, in complete control, at least for that situation, creating my own little world where I had the final say, where I could completely control a person, a person that I found physically attractive, and uh, keep them with me as long as possible even if it that's scary as hell you know even if you got your issues you don't go to that extreme dear that just shows a level of um understanding compassion a level of um what's the word i'm looking for he hasn't really got that he hasn't there's, there's no level with him is there there's, there's extremes and he doesn't really understand the differences between the extremes guys he can't fathom that out he hasn't got that cognitive thinking and ability to be able to decipher if I've gone too far or not, you know, we've all got our problems, we've all got our issues, but we don't go to the, you know, we, we there's there's levels to things, you don't just go boom, straight to the top, and he went straight to the top every time, and he just, he did it the wrong way completely, and he's a stone cold killer man. It meant just keeping a part of them. One of your dad's biggest questions is when you began to slip away, when you crossed over into this world of obsession or dark fantasy from which you just couldn't return. I think it was around <clears throat> age 14 or 15 started have, having obsessive uh, thoughts of, of uh, violence uh, intermingled with sex. That's weird. And it just got worse and worse. Uh, I didn't know how to tell anyone about it so I didn't. I just kept it all inside. Tell me about this house right here. One of the things Jeffrey kept inside early on was a bizarre teenage fascination with dead animals. This from a boy who 10 years earlier had played fiddlesticks with a bucket of animal bones. Right, there's always a link in there with psychopaths and animals, killing animals, dead animals, all of that kind of thing. There's a fascination with that. It's almost like the the early warning signs of um, a potential psychopath, all right? People who can potentially lead into Stone Cold Killers. Richard Kuklinski was the same. He, um, he liked to kill dead animals. He had no remorse. He used to enjoy it. You know, I couldn't think of anything worse. Animals to me are, in, in many ways, better than humans. I love animals, all right? Dogs, it's just I couldn't live without my dog. She's an absolute star, man. I love her. And, you know, the fact that these guys have no remorse towards animals, it just breaks my heart. It's horrible. I don't understand it. I never will. Lionel took us back to the neighborhood in Ohio, where his son's strange rituals began. He uh, rode around on his bike, and took uh, containers, garbage uh, bags and so forth, and collected road kills and brought them back and examined them. It was something Lionel says he never knew about until the trial. One of the biggest things that I've been wondering is just how on earth, how it got established with entrails, you know, with right. insides of dogs or foxes as you um, made your way around the neighborhood. On, I think it on started, started maybe started out as just uh, childhood curiosity. Just to see what it looked like right. inside? Or? Right, right. And uh, something something went wrong. Was was there some pleasure in in the cutting open of the animal? Yes, there was. No no sexual pleasure, but just a. Um, it's hard to describe. 
hard to understand. Never mind hard to describe. It's hard to understand, man. I don't get it. Sense of power, sense of control. I suppose that's a good way of putting it, yeah. It's impossible to know why Jeffrey's obsessions progressed from roadkill to humans, but it didn't take long. During our visit back to the old neighborhood, Lionel showed us where the stalking began. When Jeff was 14, he rode his bike over here from his home a couple miles away. At this location, hid in the, in the trees and the bushes with a sawed-off baseball bat waiting for a jogger to come by. And what was he going to do? Well, he was going to hit the jogger over the head with the baseball bat, make him unconscious, and lie with him, lie with a motionless body. What the hell? Do you remember at age 14, hiding in the bushes alongside that road, thinking about attacking yes. a jogger? Yes. Yeah, I remember doing that. So that's the point at which it shifted from, from animals to people. Uh, years 14 or 15 in that area, yeah. That's some he never strange, attacked any joggers. That's some strange shit, guys. But it was on these same roads at age 18 that Jeffrey, now struggling with alcoholism, picked up a hitchhiker named Stephen Hicks and brought him home. The house was empty. Jeffrey's parents had recently divorced, and he was home alone. Uh, I wish I just keep on, kept on going, but I didn't. I turned around, picked him up, and uh, that's when... That's when it, the nightmare became a reality. Jesus Christ, What happened man. after you took him to the house? Um, we talked, had some drinks. Uh, I knocked him out. And that was, that was the first time. I don't understand why I can't explain fully what he's doing he seems to have a hard time explaining but he didn't have a hard time doing it that's what i don't get with the psychology of these individuals that's weird as hell he's creepy man there's nothing behind those eyes he's got the same eyes as his mom and his dad this guy's a lunatic in august 1978 about a month after the hicks murder lionel and sherry jordan his girlfriend at the time went to check on jeffrey what was the scene like when you came into the house and saw him he had a dead look in his eye and he just looked extremely sad. He was wandering aimlessly about the house. He was very uncomfortable. Uh, his mother had moved out. Um, he, he was it, torn between the two parents. He was a lost child. Was this about some kind of desire to keep these people with you, not to be abandoned, not to have them leave? I think it, it, that did play into it. But uh, there was a big element of wanting complete control over someone, total control. He's a, he's a weirdo. Absolute weirdo, man. He's a creep. Uh, not having to, to consider their wishes, being able to keep them there as long as I wanted. And uh, that, that was a big part of it. Lust played a big part of it. Controlling lust. Once it happened the first time, it just seemed like uh, it had control of my life from there on end. I, it it uh, was a major part of my thinking from then on. Did you want to try to stop? Yes, I, I tried. I tried to stop. And the killing did stop for a while. But Jeffrey says in 1984, while living here at his grandmother's house in Milwaukee, his violent compulsions consumed him once again. One night, cruising these bars in downtown Milwaukee, he met a young man and took him to this hotel. I had put some sleeping pills in his drink to render him conscious. And I uh, was just going to spend the night with him. When I woke up in the morning, uh, my forearms were bruised and his chest was, was bruised and blood was coming out of his mouth. He was hanging over the side of the bed, and uh, I have no memory of beating him to death, but I must have. And that's when it, when it all started again. And once it started again, you found it impossible to stop? Right, that, that's when the, the obsession went into full swing.
it's it's hard to watch this kind of stuff to be honest with you guys i don't normally well, i don't normally i just don't watch this kind of stuff really i don't even watch horror films or anything like that i don't really like putting that kind of negative energy into my brain but i'm just trying to kind of this the the only way i can take it i'm not a psychologist is that this guy is a an absolute lunatic all right something seriously wrong it comes across placid he wanted to hurt people he wanted to hurt them bad and i got no sympathy for him i got no sympathy for this man in the slightest the people that the people's lives that he ruined and affected it's disgusting it's disgusting my own my only objective was to find the, the best looking uh, guy that i could i went to bathhouses i went to bars um, shopping malls uh, their sexual preference didn't matter to me. Uh, Did their race matter to you? No, their race didn't matter to me. The first, the first two young men were white. The, set, the third young man was American Indian. The fourth and fifth were Hispanic. So no, race had nothing to do with it. It was just their looks. Was it the killing that excited you, or is it what happened after the killing? No, the, the killing was just a means to an end. That, that was the least set, uh, satisfactory part. I didn't enjoy doing that. That's why... I why did he do it then? That doesn't make sense at all. all right? He's just trying to downsize the whole thing. It oh, wasn't, wasn't really the biggest part of it for me, blah, blah, blah. Just, just trying to brush it off. Well, it was a major part. All right, Killing is a major thing to do. It's a horrendous, unnatural interaction, especially in today's society. So to brush it off like that shows a lot more about his character than, uh, than, than meets the eye, actually. I tried to uh, create uh, living zombies with uh, uretic acid in the, in the drill. One of those failed experiments to create a living zombie was conducted on this 14-year-old boy. Jeffrey had drilled a hole in his head and poured in acid, a crude attempt at lobotomy that none of his victims survived. No, the killing wasn't, wasn't the objective. I just wanted to have the person under my complete control uh, to do with as I wanted. Yeah. It's not easy to say that, but that's, that's what the motive was. Was there something sexual in the dismemberment of the bodies for you? As time went on, uh, yes, I, I did get a, there was a sexual Part, part to that. Uh, I started saving the, the skeletons and preserving other parts. He's a monster. And uh, one thing led to another. It took, it took more and more uh, deviant type behaviors to satisfy uh, my urges. Well. And so it just uh, spiraled out of control. Why the cannibalism? That was, that was another step. Uh, it, it made me feel like they were a permanent part of me. Besides, besides the just mere curiosity of what it would be like, it made them feel that they were a part of me, and it, it gave me a, a sexual uh, uh, satisfaction to do that. How did Jeffrey Dahmer get away with his murderous acts for as long as he did? As we found out talking to both him and his father, Jeffrey was not... His dad doesn't seem bothered by this. I mean, his dad's chilling there as if they're having, like, tea and biscuits at the Sunday meeting, like, at the local church. It's like, oh, yeah, what, what are we going to do today? Well, we're going to talk with our Jeffrey, um, ask him what the crack is about, you know, all these murders he's committed and people he's eaten. Look at him. Look at that bloody idiot. He's an idiot, this guy, isn't he? Not only a highly efficient predator, he was also a consummate liar. I had to do a lot of lying, a lot of covering up, a lot of uh, pretending. Were there times when your dad may have been closer to discovering what was going on than even he knew? The box incident was about uh, as close as it came, yeah. The so-called box incident happened in 1989, when Jeffrey had already killed at least five young men. It was a, about a one-foot square box. Uh, metal and wood box. My dad uh, one week came to visit and happened to see it and uh, he was wondering what was in it. He didn't know, nobody knew. 
And I said, Jeff, open it up. I just want to see what's in there. We got into uh, a bit of an argument because I wouldn't open it up. And I said, Jeff, open it up or, or I'm going to just take it down. In but what, what did he have? Why would he even question what's in it? Why would he instantly be suspicious of a box? Unless you had information to believe otherwise that that was something something untowards within it. it doesn't make sense to me into the basement and get a screwdriver or something and open it up i was thinking i've got to stop this from happening he got angry very visibly agitated i thought you know it's all going to come crashing down now not uh, fathoming what could be in that box i said okay i'll just Open it up tomorrow, then, and then let's get rid of it, whatever it is. What he's was a, in the box? He's a weirdo. The mummified head and, and uh, genitals of uh, a young man I met in one of the bars down in Milwaukee. But the box was never opened. Uh, not Jesus Christ. Presence. And so the, uh, the lies continued. And so did the murders. I didn't uh, have to be accountable to anybody. I felt that uh, I could keep it in my own secret little world, keep everything under control, um, and would never have to deal with the consequences. And so things just progressed from bad to worse. Your dad has wondered about all kinds of things, from the medication that your mom was on during her pregnancy, to the fact that you were exposed to violent arguments in the home from an early age and continuing to the possibility that he might have passed on some genetic propensity for obsession or violent behavior. Does any of that ring true to you? I, I can see why he'd wonder about those things, but uh, as far as I'm concerned, they're all excuses. I feel it's uh, wrong for people who commit crimes to try to shift the blame onto somebody else, onto their parents or onto their, their upbringing or, cir or living circumstances, I, I think that's just a, a cop-out. I take full responsibility. How do you feel about what you did? I'm glad that it's over. Um, there, there's nothing, any words I say to the, to the victims. I, I can't fathom this guy out because I, I don't know if he's manipulative with the way he puts these with the way he states things, like he said, you know, I'm not going to blame anyone. I've taken full responsibility. So he's not not even manipulating his way out of this situation. But psychopaths normally do yeah, think three, four, five, ten steps ahead with their manipulative thought patterns. So I'm just trying to think about what his steps ahead are. What's he going to come up with? He isn't blaming anyone. He's taking responsibility. What's the catch? I don't know. If you know, drop a comment below. Families. Are, are just going to seem trite and empty. Uh, I, I don't know how to express the regret, the sorrow. Um, that I feel for what I've done for their for their sons. Hmm. I think that's one of the one of the catches there. He hasn't got no regret or sorrow. There is none. He's not in turmoil. He's got no emotion. All right, that's not normal, guys. That's not normal. You know, there's people who would... Uh, I mean, normal people would see a squirrel get knocked over and be mortified. And, and talking about that situation would make them upset. He's talking about people he's dismembered, mummified, you know, ate and did horrific things to with zero emotion. So, yeah. I don't believe this guy one bit. I think he's. I think he is a manipulator. I don't believe that he's got any empathy. And I don't think he can understand um, what sorrow is. He hasn't got the um, capacity to be able to do that. Uh, I can't find the right words. Is it still there, Jeff? Does it ever go away? In part, no. It never. It never completely goes away. I'll uh, probably have to live with it for the rest of my life. I wish it would go away. I wish I, there was some way to completely get rid of, of the, the compulsive thoughts, the feelings. Uh, it's not nearly so bad now that there, there's no avenues to, to actually act on it. 
but uh, no, it never seems to go completely away. So the thoughts still come to you? Sometimes, yeah. When our interview at the prison ended, Jeffrey said goodbye to his father. But on his way back to his cell, something caught his eye. Just a point of interest that that's the type of box. This is, the, this is the type of box? Exactly. Yeah, a little bigger. That's exactly what it looked like. Right. Right, okay, I didn't know that. On November 28, 1994, Jeffrey Dahmer was beaten to death in prison by a fellow inmate. Wow, so... That's took me by surprise, that, actually. I'm just trying to picture the scene. He's beaten to death by a fellow inmate. So if he's sharing a cell with this guy, surely not. That's probably the reason why. You wouldn't want to be sleeping next to this geezer, would you, who's done all of that crimes. Would you do the same? I don't know. It would be scary living with this guy, wouldn't it? But, uh, oh, well, he got what he deserved to a degree. And um, it's just a sad, sad situation, really, for the families who've been devastated by this, really. Jeffrey Dahmer, that concludes that, concludes that reaction, guys. Um, I can't say it was enjoyable because that kind of stuff's not really my cup of tea. But in terms of getting to understand a little bit more about this absolute maniac, then, yeah, I guess it was good in that respect, guys, and you wanted it, so we did it. Uh, if you've got any other reactions that you want me to react to, drop a link in the Discord or just comment on the video troops. But other than that, like, share, and subscribe to the channel, and I'll see you in the next one. Peace.